Okay, guys, we're moving on to incident management um, and the incident command system. It's boring but important is how I'll call it. Uh, the, the priority on this chapter really is going to be triage, um, and we'll talk about that near the end of this show. Okay, so, and what I was talking about is that mass casualty incident, and what do you do when there's only one or two medics and there's 30 patients? So how do you manage that? Uh, and also talking about the incident command system, and this is a uh, system has been in place for a while, and uh, we got to know it because all the different agencies use ITS, and they do that through the National Incident Management System. So uh, this National Incident Management System was started March 2004, and it's a nationwide template, and it enables federal, state, and local governments to work together. So everybody follows the Incident Command System and the National Incident Management System. Uh, so it must be flexible to rapidly adapt because things change, you know, by the second uh, sometimes on some of those mass, ca uh, mass casualty incidents. Um, so the reason this is good for, for that system, though, is it provides standardization in terminology, resources, uh, personnel training, and certification. So that way, when people all show up to the same scene, there's at least a baseline framework of, of uh, like, knowledge. So the major components of this is going to be the ICS system itself command and management, preparedness, resource management, and communications. Okay, so this is something, um, so the ICS is to, the idea of it was to ensure safety, of course, remember safety is our first priority, uh, achieve management goals, and then the, the big key here is ensuring the efficient use of resources. You probably, you probably saw it during the hurricanes that hit Puerto Rico, huge ICS failure. They had resources that were sitting in warehouses and uh, you know, they found one warehouse that had water bottles. It was like from two years ago. Um, so what, the idea is to avoid that from happening. All right. So uh, basically, one supervisor to every three or seven workers. That and that way, it's not it's not it doesn't get too big. It doesn't get too far away from anybody. Um, so this is the fancy map of of kind of what it looks like. Um, and the roles and responsibilities within this are command, finance, logistics, operations, planning, and command. So for the command, incident commander is in charge, and basically they are, they're in charge of the entire scene, and now, of course, they may hand it over to someone else if they have more experience. That's the cool thing about the system is that um, it's, it's flexible in that way. You can, change, you can change leadership if you need to. So finance, yep, unfortunately, some of these bigger mass cows with, like, multiple agencies, finance does become an issue. Uh, logistics, and that's just actually getting all the stuff you need to the right place operations and, and so that's just kind of your general daily in and out what's going on planning so that's kind of looking ahead at some maybe some some problems that might arise and then how to uh treat those and the command and staff really is that the um the safety the safety officer monitors the scene and then the public information officer provides the media with clear good information and that public information officer is important because on certain scenes, the news media just shows up and shoves cameras everywhere. And so um, it's not good to have three different people talking to the media. It's, you really only want one person, so that way it's nice streamlined. And because of that, communications has historically been a very weak point. Um, and that's why uh, communications is super important within the incident system. So preparedness is just uh, really decision, decision making made before um, an incident occurs. Um, and just kind of planning, right? Preparedness, planning, same kind of idea. Scene size up. So when you first get to that scene, you need to ask these three basic questions. What do I have? What do I need? And then what resources do I need? So usually the, the commanding, uh, the off the ICS, like incident commander, uh, will be the most senior official. And, uh, but like I said, that can move around if you need it to. Um, and so for communications, they like to use face-to-face -face communications to limit radio traffic. Um, that's also good because that way there's not, it's not so much confusion. You can, you can ask follow-up questions a lot easier. Um, you're not really stuck on the radios. Okay, so the medical incident command, that's where, we, that's where we're at. And those roles are going to be triage, treatment, and transport. So um, you can pause this if you want. You don't need to write all this down. It just, just be familiar with this. If I say triage, what does that mean? If I say transportation, what does that mean? So triage is, is patient-centered. That's sorting through the patients. Treatment is actually treating those patients. And the transportation is how to move them out of it. So a triage supervisor, they're the one who are in charge 
of all the of all the patients. And so you have a room with 30 patients in it. Trio supervisor, he's the one who walks in and starts um, deciding who needs treatment. So they locate, they gotta get that good treatment area, and there's a lot of work that should go into picking out your location. Um, it needs to be, you know, one way in, one way out. I mean, there's a few different ways to do it, but uh, special attention needs to be paid to the patient itself. Transportation supervisor, they coordinate the transportation to and from. So if there's, you know, just ambulance upon ambulance showing up to the scene, the transportation supervisor helps um, point them in the right direction. And staging supervisor, same idea. It's a staging area. It, it works with the triage area and helps set up like your treatment and the evaluation of the patients. So the physicians on scene, if you're lucky enough to have them, uh, they are going to provide on-scene medical direction to EMTs, and they're going to provide care in the treatment section of that map you saw. And a rehabilitation supervisor, uh, really, it's just an area that provides protection from elements and situations. It monitors the, like, looks for signs of stress and PTSD and responders, um, and they also take care of rest, food, all that stuff. And then extrication and special rescue, um, in the event that you have that situation, that, that's kind of a separate bit, they will take care of all that. So as you can tell, this would be a mess to get through. Uh, morgue supervisor, they are the ones who um, really know what to do with the deceased patients. Um, the morgue area should be out of the view of everyone else because it's not doing anyone any favors for them to see that. Uh, but as you can see right now, uh, in like for example, in New York with the coronavirus, um, the morgue supervisors are working really hard because they're running out of room to put the, the bodies. So they're putting them in like refrigerated trucks and it's, it's a mess. All right, mass casualty incident. This is the important bit I was talking to you about. So um, they say any call involving three or more patients, uh, but really it's, it's just, it's an issue where if you're overwhelmed uh, or I guess it could be any situation that requires a mutual aid response, but um, generally, it's it's really a mass cal is when the the uh, medics on the ground have been overwhelmed by the situation and they help. So it doesn't necessarily need to be three patients. So this is like the perfect map. If we could choose, if we could make um, if we could make our area, this is what we'd want. We want the triage area to be uh, away from the scene, and we would triage them in their different colors, and then we would evacuate them. So all system system protocols want to declare an MCI and initiate the incident command system. So um, their example of that would be you and your team cannot treat or transport all the injured patients at the same time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if you find yourself in a situation, you need to declare a mass casualty incident and then request additional resources and then initiate the EPS system. So triage, like I said, this is going to be the very important part of this chapter. So basically a patient can be broken down into one of these four spots, one of these four like titles either immediate, delayed, minimal, or expect. <clears throat> so here you go. Um, you might just want to like pause this real quick just so you can read it, but think of uh, red is bad, as in you need treatment right now. So signs of shock, uncontrolled bleeding, stuff like that. Yellow is delayed, and that just means they need to go, but you have a little bit of time. So things like burns without airway problems, uh, multiple broken bones, stuff like that. Uh, now, a green tag is kind of like that walking wounded, and those guys are, hell, they can even help you if you need, if you're in a mass count, it's really bad, you can have greens um, do work. So, those are like minor fractures, like a broken arm, like, yeah, sure, he needs to go to a hospital, but there's probably people who need to go first, so um, we can kind of wait on him. And then our black is going to be expectant, and that's people who um, are dead or who really just have very small chance of actually making it. So... There's a bunch of different uh, models of these you can buy uh, different places, but they're all the, generally the same idea. So it's a way of tagging and sorting your patient. So the start triage is basically, um, that's the system they have. Uh, military uses a slightly different one, but it's the exact same idea. So basically, like when you first walk to that scene, call to patients to direct them to like to go somewhere. So if you walk in a room and there's a bunch of patients, you can say, hey, if you can hear my voice, come to me, come to me. Or you know, go down, go over here, go over there, wherever. You you want to you want to start separating them right away. And so if those people are walking wounded. They can get up, and move around. Cool. But you already know that you can deal with them a little bit later. What you need to do is look on the patients on the ground, and then you need to look at respirations and and pulse and kind of things. Jumpstart triage is just 
It's the exact same triage system, but it's just for children um, younger than eight or who weigh less than 100 pound, uh, pounds. And same idea, uh, you wanna separate them, hey, come to me, come to me. And then after that, if you run up there and there's no pulse or does not begin to breathe after opening the airway and some rescue breathing, Unfortunately, um, it's probably expectant. Uh, if, if that person was the only patient, cool, you can work on them. But in this environment, you probably are gonna have to come back to them. So a problem with, also with just this issue all, all considered is that some patients are gonna be hysterical and disruptive and they're not gonna know what to do. It's almost like a mental health emergency and they will just gum up your whole system. So you need to have a, you need to expect that there might be some uh, mental health issues uh, in a mass casualty incident. And now a rescuer becomes sick or injured should become an immediate priority because you need that guy back in the fight. And then last thing is we need to make sure we're identifying patients that are contaminated uh, with some sort of chemical and then we have to go through their decon. I'll talk about that. So basically all patients triage is immediate or delayed should be transported by ground or air ambulance right away. In large situations, a, I mean a bus can be used for walking wounded. Um, all right, so two or three at a time. Um, the slightly injured are transported last, and then expecting patients who are still alive would receive treatment and transport last. Um, and it just depends on, you know, the situation uh, and, and how often you're checking on those expectancies. Okay, so a disaster, this is what we're talking about, some sort of flood or earthquake, fire, hurricane, something like that. Um, you have to make that casualty collection area. We call that, or a CCP in the military, call it a casualty collection point. And that's just the area that everyone's going to go to um, to start our trip. Okay. Um, so if you, when you arrive at a potential hazmat incident, you, you need to take a step back and, and really assess the situation and assess all the different things that are going on. Uh, because if you just rush into that event, um, you might be injured yourself. So, um, we should all have, as first responders, we should all have a basic level of experience and understanding. Just simple things like, what are some of the hazardous substances? How do we tell what those substances are? How do we protect ourselves? So, um, yeah, there you go, stuff like that. Okay, now we wanna look at our whole scene. We wanna look at our visual indicators and when in doubt, I want you guys should park uphill or upwind, uh, just if there's any sort of um, hazardous material situation. Okay. Um, and there's just an example of some things that, that might be a potential hazmat situation. All right, so, and these are just more examples of things we're worried about. All right, so, yep. So, and remember, uh, the point here they're saying is it's not just like chemical factories that are full of chemicals. You might find some, some pretty dangerous chemicals in all of different areas. Okay, so a container, we can just zip through these. Um, I don't think you're gonna have a ton of questions about this on the registry. Uh, you know, here we are. So it's just different types of containers. And I don't, you don't need to, you know, memorize these or anything. It's just showing you, it's just really just showing you guys what some of the stuff looks like. Like if you come to a scene, you see these things, what are you looking for? So there you go. Okay. Yep. Very interesting stuff. Okay. Awesome. So placards, this is the other important part. Of, and, and the reason we, we were talking about those containers is because those containers, if it's a hazmat thing, they're going to have these placards on it. And we have to pay attention to these placards because they, these placards will tell us what's going on. So um, there you go. That's an example. You've probably been on the highway or something, driven around and seen these or something. So this is just what I'm talking about. And there you go. So that's just an example of some of the placards you're going to see. And it's a scene safety thing. This is, this kind of goes into your, your, your scene size up. Uh, you have to read placards and figure out what it is. Now, Department of Transportation does not require that all chemical shipments are marked, but um, the most of the time they Okay, and then there you go, 2008 Emergency Response Book. This is the book that has all the placards, and so you could find the placard, look it up in the book, and then try to decide what, uh, what's going on. So these MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheets, that is gonna be a, a sheet that's specific to the chemical, has all the information. It'll tell you the chemical makeup, it'll tell you the hazards, it'll tell you first aid in the event that you're exposed, um, and then anything else that's important. So. So that the MSDS are very important, all right? And that's the data sheet about the chemical itself. Okay, cool, there is an example. Um, shipping papers, keep an eye out for shipping papers that there might be some extra information on that. Okay, there you go. Okay, um, the, chem the Chemical Transportation Emergency Center um, has lots of information about all different chemicals um, where they're going. So try to identify 
uh, those chemicals and keep an eye out for some sort of strange looking smoke or cloud. Uh, for example, different colored smoke, different colored fire, those things are a key. Um, any sort of weird leaking or any sort of weird smell in the area, we probably don't want to go in it. So if we think it's a hazmat thing, we want to stop upwind uh, and uphill and call a hazmat team and go forward. Okay, so establish control zones because we want to make sure we're really controlling who's in and out. So there you go, hot zone where the hazard material is. There's the warm zone where you, you, it's not totally safe, but you're out of the hot zone, and that's where the, decont the decontamination occurs. And then the cold zone where the command post and everything else is. So hot zone, there you go. That's where that's where the action is. Warm zone is a little bit further out. And then our cold zone is where the commanding officer is. So as a EMT, your job is to triage, tra uh, treatment, transport, rehab. Okay, so those are the things that we are going to be able to do in these environments. Okay, yep, so there you go. These are just some toxicity levels. Um, and then like also the suits that we want to wear with that. So if it's zero, we don't even need a lot of protection. And then it goes all the way to a four where it's a special level A suit. Okay, so any trauma that has resulted from vehicle collision or fire, and you know that that's going to be there. And then there's also the injuries from the toxic uh, substance itself. So you actually kind of two things going on. Okay, um, depending on what's going on, you might have to wear a full breathing uh, apparatus, gloves, goggles, protective coat, the whole thing. Um, so the last thing we're going to talk about here is that le is these levels of PPE. Okay, so just take a real quick note, write these down. Level A is the most dangerous, most hazardous, and it requires the full-on like spacesuit. Okay, level A, most hazardous spacesuit. Level B is non-encapsulated protective clothing, so it protects against a particular hazard, um, and it also is going to have their own breathing supply, scuba, eye protections, like that. Uh, level C is non-permeable clothing and eye protection and a face mask that filters the air. Level D is just kind of like your normal work uniform. And note there that all levels require the use of gloves. So just know those uh, levels A. Okay, there you go. There you go. So try to try to just look at that and remember that that is the different levels of PPE that we're talking about. You might have a question that just straight up says which is the highest level of PPE or use of of uh, not of just a respirator and your duty uniform is considered what. So just know the ins and outs of these different um, PPE. So. I uh, know it was not super exciting, guys, but that's unfortunately um, some of these chapters. It's just it's just knowledge and and uh, that's what it is. So don't worry, though, we're about done.